is advancing faster than expected in Europe. An annual report by the World Meteorological Organization and the European Copernicus Network says the average temperature on the continent is 2.3 degrees warmer than it was at the end of the 19th century. This overheating doubles the global average and fuels exceptional heat waves and droughts. As can be seen in this graph, warming has soared since the 1990s, breaking temperature records on several occasions. The heating has been uneven geographically, reaching around 2 degrees above average in much of Western Europe and even exceeding 3.5 degrees in regions close to the Arctic. Summer last year was the hottest on record in many European countries. The report says extreme weather-related events have claimed more than 16,000 lives and directly affected 156,000 people. A tourist submarine carrying five people has vanished on its way to visit the Titanic shipwreck. The sudden disappearance has sparked a search and rescue operation. Open gate expeditions take small crews of citizen scientists at the cost of €250,000 per person to the wreck, which lies on the ocean floor at 3,800 metres and is located at about 600 kilometres off the coast of Newfoundland, Canada. A British businessman, Hamish Harding, is believed to be among those on board. Me viene un señor que me dice que es médico y me dice, ¿tú sabes a qué viene? Digo, si te digo la verdad, no sé a qué vengo. Al día siguiente viene un señor que era celador de quirófano con una camilla para llevarme al hospital, al quirófano y me hace la operación. Pero no sé qué clase de operación era. Entonces, me hice la operación, cuando me veo la cicatriz en el espejo, digo esto que y, y entonces cuando me dice que me han hecho una operación para no traer. Vale cuando empecé a salir con Antonio. Y porque mi suegra quería ser abuela. Los padres de Rosario nunca la vieron capaz de ser madre. Con una discapacidad intelectual del 67% decidieron esterilizarla sin su consentimiento con 21 años. Cuando vi a Antonio me se iluminó la cara, aunque no lo conocía de nada, me se iluminó la cara como siempre que lo veo. Los padres de Rosario la amenazaron para llevarla al hospital. Si no accedía, la separarían de Antonio, su pareja, desde hace más de 30 años y la internarían en una residencia de por vida. Mi familia me han tratado siempre como si fuera... Diferente. No tenía ilusión para nada. Me quería morir. Me quería quitar la vida. Pero no lo hice porque había una persona que quería. Que era mi pareja. Y lo hacía por él. Yo me sentía mal porque la trataban mal. Han intentado varias veces que nos separáramos. El poquito cariño que tenía se, se murió cuando me operaron. Yo no tengo una conversación como una hija o un padre. Yo no. Yo no confío más. Ni quiero confiar. Me pasa igual, me siento vacío igual. Porque podíamos haber sido padres, aunque decían que no estábamos preparados para pa ser padres. Tenían que habérselo dicho. Lo que pasa es que yo no, no, no le decían nada a ella porque ya sabía de que ella se iba a oponer, o sea, que ella iba a decir que no se operaba. Entonces es más fácil callarse la boca, no, pre, no decirle nada y cogerla de sorpresa. La esterilización forzada a mujeres con discapacidad sigue presente en Europa. La llave para obligar a todos los países a acabar con ella está en las instituciones europeas. El Parlamento está debatiendo una legislación vinculante que prohíba esta práctica. 
Me pareció una forma de dominación muy cruel, tanto de la sexualidad como de la reproducción. Y me pareció también eh, una forma darwinista de aproximación también a todo lo humano, ¿no? Cómo queremos eliminar a las personas eh, a las que previamente hemos patologizado. A pesar de que el Convenio de Estambul prohíbe la esterilización forzada, solo nueve países europeos lo hacen. Suecia fue el primero y España el último en prohibirla en 2020, pero en países como Francia o Hungría sigue siendo posible. Los gobiernos que se oponen a, a considerar la esterilización forzada como un tipo penal y por tanto a perseguir la esterilización forzada en todos sus casos, son buena parte de los que también se oponen a incorporarla en la directiva. Eh, bueno, pues República Checa, Eslovaquia o Hungría, ¿no? Pero también hay eh, gobiernos que serían favorables a una ampliación de esos tipos penales en la directiva y que, sin embargo, contemplan la esterilización forzada para personas con discapacidad, ¿no? Eh, hablamos de Portugal o de algunos de los requisitos que se plantean en Bélgica o Francia, ¿no? O sea, que intuitivamente no nos parecerían... Eh, ...países contrarios a los derechos humanos... ...ni a los derechos de las personas con discapacidad. A prolonged period of high inflation... ...that's what the head of the International Monetary Fund... ...Kristalina Georgieva warns could be the reality for the Eurozone... ...despite showing resistance to the knock-on effect... ...of Russia's invasion of Ukraine... ...and the largest period of trade shock in several decades... ...economic activity remains weak... ...overshadowed by the threat of rising inflation. Well, what... Right now, the most important thing for Europe is to get uh, a handle on inflation. Why? Because inflation is bad for growth and it is a tax on the poor. Uh, when we look into the medium long term, critical for Europe is to uh, spur more innovation and uh, create more dynamism. Uh, there are pathways to do so, completing the banking union, advancing on the capital market union, make the financial assets of Europe that are quite significant. In an interview with Euronews, Georgieva said high inflation could negatively impact growth based on the IMF's latest projections, indicating inflation could stay above the central bank target until mid-2025. Uh, the EU is a very important player globally. The European economy is... Uh, Um, if you take the whole 27 member cities compatible to the United States, uh, certainly compatible to China, how Europe pushes on respect for WTO rules, coordination and cooperation to reduce the cost of fragmentation matters. And let's remember, many of the European economies are small, open economies. If we undermine the engine of growth that is trade, that would affect negatively the European people. Inflation in the European Union reached over 10% last year, but it is now showing signs of moderation. The European Central Bank forecasts that inflation will average at 5.4% this year and decrease to 2.2% by 2025. However, this forecast is still higher than the ECB's preferred rate of 2%. You ever stop and realize how fragile all this is? Wouldn't take much all, to throw us right back into barbaric times. All you'd have to do would be eliminate electricity. New York, one of the biggest cities in the world, plunges into darkness in the blink of an eye. It's just after 4 p.m on August 14th, 2003, and an unthinkable disaster becomes reality. A cascade of power failures shuts down electricity in Southeast Canada and across eight Northeastern states. Cities like New York are brought to a complete standstill. Hundreds of people are trapped in subway tunnels while the traffic above becomes a nightmare of gridlock. In all, 55 million people lost power for up to two days. The main culprit, 
a sagging high voltage power line in Northern Ohio that brushed up against an overgrown tree. There's a weird calmness about this hearing. This is not calm. The Russians are already in the grid. This is not a threat. This is happening. We are under attack. We are in a very dangerous place. I just think this has to be an emergency, an urgent situation. What would the catastrophic consequences be at a human level if you tried to live in a non-electricity world given the way we built our civilization? John Wellinghoff was chairman of FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, a small government agency with jurisdiction over the U.S. high-voltage transmission system. Wellinghoff commissioned a study to see if a physical attack on critical transformers could trigger cascading blackouts. It was actually a very shocking result to us that there's very few number of substations you need to take out uh, in the entire United States to knock out the entire grid. Knock out the entire grid? That's correct. How many would it take to knock out putting the entire country in a blackout? Less than 20. A lot of people, when they think of a nuclear war, what comes to mind is the image of a mushroom clouds, cities laid to waste, but that may not be the way a nuclear war actually looks today. So if you detonate a nuclear weapon 200 kilometers or higher in outer space, people on the ground might not even know that it happened, but it will send an electromagnetic pulse charge down and damage all the components critical to the electric grid. In other words, a nuclear explosion in the atmosphere above the United States could unleash a burst of invisible electrical energy that within a fraction of a second could wash over this country and overload all of our most sensitive electronic devices, including the nation's power grid. An EMP pulse is a very dangerous threat, uh, and it's a realistic threat. It's something that would basically, if you're not nuclear hardened, it will basically shut down any digital computer uh, that is operating in the, in the range of the EMP. So if you set off an EMP, a high altitude burst EMP, basically every light in this hotel is gonna go off, every computer is gonna go off, every cell phone is gonna go off. That's what an EMP does. The power of an EMP is potentially devastating and it's an open secret among nuclear-capable countries. We actually know that the Russians, the Chinese, the Iranians have in their war plans the first strike plan to take out our electrical power system with an EMP attack. It's not speculation. We know that. We learned it about the Russians when the USSR collapsed. There were a number of defectors that left Russia and came to the United States. So they showed up here with boxes, suitcases full of data showing what the Russians planned to do with an EMP attack, what the Russians had given in information to the Chinese. Famed insurer Lloyds of London issued a comprehensive report about the risk of a major geomagnetic storm to the world's economy. Lloyds pointed out that a Carrington-level extreme geomagnetic storm is almost inevitable in the future and also mentioned that the duration of any outage could last up to two years and is largely dependent on the availability of spare replacement transformers. This threat has now silently grown to where it is perhaps one of the largest natural disaster scenarios that the country could face, that society could face. How likely is it that we're going to have a storm of the severity, of, let's say, of the Carrington event? I don't think it's a question of if we're going to have such a storm, it's a question of when. An executive order relating to GMD was passed in 2016, but there was terribly ineffective regulator follow-through, creating essentially no GMD protection. If you think that this EMP and GMD issue is just a right-wing cause, consider what happened in the state of California in 2018. 
Its legislature, dominated by Democrats, unanimously passed two bills that formally recognize the urgent threats posed by EMPs and geomagnetic disturbances. I think it's appropriate and important for California to make a statement about this. This measure urges the president and Congress to work together to implement grid hardening measures to help ensure our nation's critical electrical infrastructure is protected from threats of electric magnetic impulses and physical attacks on the infrastructure. The problem is, four years later, there's still been no concrete action. For those deeply concerned about these issues, California's failure to follow through has been a profound disappointment. This is a fixable problem, and it's completely bipartisan, but we need to come together around solutions that will work. Legislation to provide structure and regulatory discipline, and then people on the ground to get it done. The highly credentialed EMP Commission has provided detailed recommendations in their early reports to Congress. On our website, we've outlined a few of the highest priority action steps to protect our civilian infrastructure, and we will ensure we will follow through. How we respond to the looming threat facing our grid will ultimately be judged by history. Visit our website at griddownpowerup.com and send emails to your legislators, utility companies, and regulators, and urge them to take action now to protect America's future. If you are concerned about our electrical power system surviving, you need to let your legislator know how you feel. And if enough people make enough noise, we can get this through. I know we can get this done. pandemic. Some states use taxpayer money to fund vaccine lotteries. In West Virginia, which had one of the largest sweepstakes, anyone who got that COVID shot could register for cash and prizes. But now there is scrutiny over whether the money was wasted and if the programs actually worked. Scott McFarlane has the story. This was the moment. Now I'm really nervous. <laughs> Grace Fowler, a medical worker trying to help her community through COVID, received what she thought was a wonderful surprise. All of a sudden there's cameras. Yes. And there's the governor. Yes. And a photo op. Yes. It was exciting. Wow, I'd won a truck, you know. Yeah. Wait, what? <laughs> No, I did it. She was one of the hundreds of winners who entered West Virginia's Do It For Baby Dog vaccine sweepstakes run by the state's colorful governor, family, Jim Justice. You've got to get vaccinated for baby dog. West Virginia's vaccine lottery was massive, more than $20 million in prizes, larger than lotteries in neighboring Ohio and Maryland combined and named after Justice's pet dog with scholarships, vacations, cash. A million five hundred and eighty eight thousand dollars. What? And trucks. CBS News has learned federal investigators have subpoenaed Governor Justice's office about the sweepstakes. The focus, according to the governor's staff, are those trucks and questions about how much they cost taxpayers. Only after Fowler brought home her prize did she learn the value may have been inflated and along with it, her tax bill. What was your reaction when they sent you a bill for $20,000 plus it for your my truck? Mind. <laughs> I was like, okay. So I said, the next time someone says you win, I'm going to say keep it. <laughs> the lottery has also triggered a political battle at home, where the Republican governor recently launched a bid for U.S. Senate. One of Justice's critics, a state auditor who reviewed spending for the lottery, says it was hastily executed and rushed taxpayer money out the door to private businesses. It's very, very hard for me to manage in really quick, short time frames. Is this okay? Is this legal? Where's this going? What was the contract? Where's the documentation? Where are the dates, right? 
Republican State Senator Eric Tarr, a political rival of the governor, said the tens of millions of federal dollars spent by Governor Justice for incentives missed the mark. Did the vaccine lottery help boost the vaccination rate? No, I don't believe it did. If you're going to spend $21 million to improve vaccination rate, you would expect to see a little bump if it was something that was going to be an effective plan. It's a little too ambitious. It's way too ambitious for something that really had no reason to know that it announced a special concert planned for tonight on the South Lawn to commemorate the Juneteenth holiday and for June being Black Music Month. And this comes after last weekend's Pride celebration, which the administration called the biggest Pride event ever at the White House. Our Nancy Cordes joins us now from Washington with more details. Nancy, good morning. Good morning, Anne-Marie. administration announced a special concert planned for tonight on the South Lawn to commemorate the Juneteenth holiday and for June being Black Music Month. And this comes after last weekend's Pride celebration, which the administration called the biggest Pride event ever at the White House. Our Nancy Cordes joins us now from Washington with more details. Nancy, good morning. Good morning, Anne-Marie. Um, so Juneteenth concert planned for tonight on the South Lawn. Can you tell us anything about the celebrations and will it be live streamed? Sure, this White House loves a concert, <laughs> and Marie, it, it will likely be live streamed on the WhiteHouse.gov website. This is, of course, a concert to commemorate uh, the new holiday, only two years old, that President Biden signed into law, marking the end of slavery, the first new federal holiday since Martin Luther King Day. Uh, and so they're going to have a lot of luminaries on the stage, Audra McDonald, uh, Legacy, Jennifer Hudson, there will be bands and singers from historically black colleges and universities. Uh, and hopefully the president will uh, be um, in, in good health and good spirits after having a root canal yesterday mm. so that he can enjoy it. And, um, uh, you know, this, this follows, as you mentioned, the big pride event over the weekend. So the White House looking to show support for groups that it believes uh, need as much support as they can get right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, as you know, uh, a number of things related to pride in the LGBT community have sparked controversy, whether it's, you know, an item being sold in a store or, yeah. or laws being changed. The White House held this big event last weekend. Yeah. Uh, the Biden administration called it the largest pride event hosted at the White House. Why was it important for the administration to do this? The, White, uh, the president put it this way, he said, happy Pride Month, happy Pride life. Mm. Uh, the White House really believes that the LGBTQ plus community is under attack, uh, both uh, on social media and in the, in the wider community and, and, and specifically uh, with legislation targeting uh, transgender individuals, for example, and their medical care or um, in Florida banning uh, the ability of teachers to talk about sexual preference uh, to young students. And so uh, the president made a point uh, amid all the festivities and the music uh, at the, uh, on the South Lawn over the weekend of saying that there are specific things that this administration is doing.